but uh, yeah, so we we should be good. Um, we are studying cells in chapter three. A couple things. So we did the first chapter was like an orientation, um, terminology, getting you to know all that stuff. The second one was chemistry. Chemistry that applies to the human body. This one is cells, and we're following the levels of organization. So we had atoms, molecules, compounds, and we do the levels of organization. We did that in chapter two. So atoms, elements, compounds. Atoms and elements are the same thing. Atoms, elements, molecules, and compounds. And now we're getting to organelles and cells in chapter three. So those are the next two on that level of organization. Organelles are these structures right here, and we're going to talk about each one. This is a horrible model of a cell. I am holding it upside down right now. Uh, but it is a horrible model. I usually have really nice models, but there's just not one here. I looked. But these are organelles, and then this whole thing collectively is a cell. So it's following the levels of organization. Atoms and elements are the smallest. You put elements together, you have a molecule. You put molecules together, you have a compound. You put compounds together, you have organelles. And you put organelles together, you have a cell. And the cell is the smallest unit of life, which is how we tie all of this in. And guess what you're made of? Cells. On Tuesday, I told you you're nothing more than a bag of cells. And that was for your self-esteem only. Okay? So... Um, cells are the structural and functional unit of life. Do you remember what the study of structure is called? Anatomy. Anatomy. And what the study of function is called? Physiology. Physiology. So structural and functional, these words, once you start to recognize them and you see those patterns, it should all kind of fall together. So cells are the structural and functional units of life. There is nothing living that is smaller than a cell. So all the chemistry we spoke on, that is, there's none of that that is alive. The smallest unit of life is a cell. All living organisms are composed of cells. Whether you're a bacteria, an amoeba, a roach, a dog, or a human, you are made up of cells. Shape determines function. Shape determines function. If it's the key to your house, when you get to your house and you put it in the lock of your door, guess what it does? Hopefully it opens your door, or you're at the wrong house. But if you take the key to your house and you put it in the ignition of your vehicle, it does nothing because it is the wrong shape. Wrong shape. Okay? Shape determines function. It applies to everything. So it mentions that. The continuity of life has a cellular basis. That's a fancy way of saying you're a bag of cells and guess what you came from? A bag of cells. <laughs> Yes, so your parents being a bag of cells, your father created sperm, your mother created egg, one sperm, one egg came together, a sperm is a cell, an egg is a cell, came together and they made you, who is now a bag of cells, okay? So that's what that's referencing, that's a fancy way of saying we continue because we're all cells. All right, <clears throat> so why cells? Well, because that's what you're made up of, and there's over 200 types of cells in your body, Okay. Composing overall around 100 trillion cells is what makes you up. When we talk about different types of cells, and we are going to learn all these, but fibroblasts are a type of cell. Erythrocytes, that's red blood cells. You have epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are your skin. They're found in your glands. They're also found in your nails. We'll talk there. Okay. We have muscle cells. So you have skeletal here and smooth muscle. We also spoke on cardiac muscle the other day, just so you know, because there's three types of muscle. You have fat cells, which we will end up calling adipocytes, right? Because that's the anatomical version of that. We also have macrophages. These are part of your immunity, okay, overall. Even though you don't have an immune system, we have immunity as, like, it's all working together. Macrophages are responsible for engulfing antigens. You have neurons, which are your nerve cells. And then, of course, here's an example of a sperm cell, cellular reproduction, or not cellular, sexual reproduction. Sperm cells, of course, hold only half the genetic material. 
half of dad's genetic material and egg cell carries half of mom's genetic material so that when it comes together it can make you, okay? And we'll discuss that briefly in this chapter as well. So, as we get go, start going through this, we the first part of this is just talking about the anatomy of the cell. More so than you really want to know. Okay? But those of you going into pharmacology or any type of diagnostic medicine, this is going to apply to you almost every day. And, and what the things that you prescribe to your patients, the way that you treat them. If you become an osteopathic doctor, you treat holistically. This is a big deal. Okay? So even though it's not like super exciting right now, the small principles that I will teach you will apply across your entire career. All right, so this cell, the first thing that you and I are going to study is how we generally refer to the cell. The very outside layer is called the plasma membrane, but it is also called the cell membrane, and is also called the phospholipid bilayer, yes. So, <laughs> I know, I get excited about stupid stuff. Let me write that because you're probably like, how do you spell that? And I'm probably going to misspell it. But plasma membrane, cell membrane, I forgot an eraser today. And phospho, phospholipid bilayer. The reason why I am writing these down is because you're gonna, they're used interchangeably throughout your text, throughout your tests, throughout your labs. They just expect you to know that they're all the same thing. Okay? So plasma membrane, cell membrane, and phospholipid bilayer are all the exact same thing. They're the outside boundary of that cell. They're the outside boundary of that cell. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip down to the third one and then go back. The nucleus is the control center of that cell. The nucleus is the control center of the cell. It houses all your genetic material. The nucleus houses all your genetic material. Do you remember if your genetic material was the carbohydrate, lipid, protein, or nucleic acid? Nucleic acid. What's the name of your genetic material? Did you say it the long way? Yeah. yeah. Deoxy, ribo, nucleic acid. Should we say it together and hold hands? We're not going to hold hands. I'm kidding. <laughs> but when you just say it, you sound smart. So you should just go say it. Oh, deoxy, ribo, nucleic acid. People are going to think you're smart. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, it's just deoxy, ribo, nucleic acid. Nucleus has all the genetic material. Plasma membrane, cell membrane, phospholipid bilayer is on the outside. So then that leaves us with cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is everything that is outside the nucleus, but inside the plasma membrane. So all of this is collectively called cytoplasm. Anything that's outside the nucleus, but inside the plasma membrane is considered cytoplasm. Okay? Now, not on this slide... But in a few slides, it's going to tell you cytoplasm is, has two components. And I'm going to point them out to you, but here's another one of my chart type things. The components of cytoplasm are cytosol, which is the semi-solid liquid. which kind of contradicts itself, but I'll explain. And then the organelles. So cytoplasm includes cytosol and the organelles. Cytoplasm is everything outside the nucleus but inside the plasma membrane, so everything here. Each of these is an organelle. Okay, each of these structures is an organelle. So that covers this part. The organelles. The cytosol is everything here in gray. And if 
you could feel the consistency of it, it's like a warm jello. Okay? If we made jello warm, it would become liquid, but our body temperature is warm, so it's not, it, it would not be correct to say it's like jello. But it's warm, it's our body temperature, and it separates everything. It kind of holds it in place like a jello mold would do. Okay? So the, this gray area here is not just colored in to make it all look together well. This is literally holding these organelles apart from each other and holding them all in place. Okay? So again, general anatomy of a cell, we have the plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer, or cell membrane on the outside. We have the nucleus, which can, has the genetic material on the very center, which is the DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. Then we have the cytoplasm, which is everything that's outside the nucleus, but inside the plasma membrane, and has two components, cytosol and the organelles. Everybody okay so far? So if I didn't have a model, this model, I would have a really good model that looks something like this. This is the cell that I believe is on your final exam in here. Your final exam review has been uploaded in Canvas since I put it all together, but there will be a day that I actually take and explain how to study and all of that for this, okay? So it's here, um, but here it's showing you kind of in a three-dimensional way. This is the plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer, or cell membrane. Here is the nucleus, and everything outside the nucleus but inside is considered cytoplasm. You have the semi-solid liquid here, and then you have all the different organelles, okay? And I will come back to this to kind of reference it in a moment. The next few slides are going to go through each organelle. And we're going to say, this is the name of that organelle, and this is what it does, okay? That's what the next few slides are going to do. And I say few, I mean like a lot. We're actually going to spend, I believe, ten slides just talking about the plasma membrane, which is the one we're going to start with first, okay? Then we're going to go into each of the others. So the first one is the plasma membrane, which I already told you is also called the cell membrane or the phospholipid bilayer. It has, what is a lipid again? Uh, fats. It's composed of fats and protein. proteins. Every cell membrane in your body has fat and protein. Okay? And they're constantly, in a constantly changing fluid mosaic. What it's trying to tell you is that a cell right here is not identical to the cell right next to it as far as where everything is arranged. They all have the exact same genetic material. What's genetic material again? DNA. You have the exact same DNA in a skin cell as you have in your heart cell. And that matches the DNA you have in your eye cell. And we'll get to that. But they don't have to actually physically look identical. So that's what that's saying, fluid mosaic. The cell membrane, plasma membrane, or phospholipid bilayer separates intracellular fluid, which from this point on is referred to as ICF, from extracellular fluid, which is abbreviated ECF. Okay? When you first read that, you're like, okay, well, oh my gosh. Intracellular fluid is what's inside the cell. Guess what extracellular is? Outside. So it just keeps what's inside, inside, and what's outside, outside. Don't let all of this overwhelm you. Make it simple. E intracellular fluid, extracellular fluid. Plasma membrane, it's separating it. Then you have interstitial fluid. Why not just make it more difficult? <laughs> From this point forward, interstitial fluid is abbreviated IF. And it reads in a sentence like if, if you're not paying attention, obviously, because it's if. All right. Interstitial fluid is fluid between cells. Okay? So say that each of you is an individual cell. And your skin, bless you, is serving as your plasma membrane or phospholipid bilayer or cell membrane. It's keeping what's inside of you, which is your intracellular fluid, separate from what's outside of you, which is your extracellular fluid. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're each cells. But there's fluid that travels between your cells. 
So right now, I'm just kind of going between to kind of demonstrate, and I'm considered interstitial fluid because I'm just going between the cells. It is completely correct to assume that interstitial fluid and extracellular fluid could be exactly the same because I am extracellular right now, but I'm also interstitial to these two cells. Intercellular fluid is inside that cell. Extracellular fluid is outside the cell. Interstitial fluid is fluid between cells. Fluid between cells. It is possible for a fluid to be considered extracellular outside of that cell and interstitial at the exact same time. Be in between cells. Is all extracellular fluid interstitial fluid? Great question. It's a point of reference. So if I'm just speaking on this group of cells right here, I'm extracellular, but I'm not in between you right now. Okay? So it, they can be, it just depends on where you're referencing from. So when you're looking like at a cancer tumor, extracellular and interstitial don't always have to be the same. But they could be. I just want to make sure you understand that, that it just because it's extracellular, then not just a few millimeters over, is it all of a sudden become interstitial. It's possible that they could overlap, and it's possible that they could be completely different. Okay? You're not going to have to distinguish between that. In this course, I need you to just understand the difference in the terms. Once we can build your vocabulary, we'll, we'll start running with it. Questions on interstitial, extracellular, or intracellular? This is the kind of model that I like to teach with. This shows you phospholipids, one layer, and then another layer of phospholipids. So it's called a phospholipid bilayer. This part right here, these little round parts, these are made of phosphate, which is the phospho part. Guess what the tails are made of? Phospholipids. They're fat. When you put fat in water, which is what you're mostly composed of, what does fat do when it's in water? It, it goes away from it. It tries to get away from it. So that's why this has to have a part that likes water, which we're about to learn these terms as well. It's called hydrophilic. The phosphate portion is hydrophilic. And it protects the lipid portion that is hydrophobic. What do you think hydrophobic means? Fear of water. Hydrophilic, it likes water, and it interacts with water. Hydrophobic, it's afraid of water. <clears throat> so that I can make this parallel with you and you understand how these work, I, as soon as I saw the way phospholipids work, and you can actually Google and on YouTube, type in phospholipid membrane, and it will bring up videos to kind of show you what it looks like so that you can see what it, how it all associates together. But when I watch the movie Big Hero 6, I don't know how many of you have seen Big Hero 6, but they have these little magnet things that when he thinks, it tells that machine and it builds, it erects this entire amazing whatever it is, staircase, columns, whatever, out of these magnets that immediately know just to put themselves in order. If I have phospholipids right here in my hand, they do absolutely nothing. They just sit there. But as soon as you take these phospholipids that could be randomly arranged and you put them in water, they immediately line up perfectly. Immediately. That's what happens in every single one of your cells. As soon as these lipids are created and, and they're put in water, which your water, your water base, they immediately form that membrane naturally. It's the properties that they have. These two layers here, excuse me, <clears throat> are protecting the fats. Because outside your cell is the water, inside your cell is water. So we need the part that's hydrophilic on the outside and the part that's hydrophobic on the inside. So this white structure here is being depicted right here. Okay? This is the phospholipid bilayer. You see these purple structures, which are going to come up in the notes in a moment? Those are proteins. So... There, I told you on that previous slide, it's part lipid, part protein. Lipid part, protein part. 
We have two types of proteins, and this is going to be further in the notes. I'm just using this while I have a diagram because I like to use models to teach. This right here is considered an integral protein because it goes all the way through. Do you know what the word peripheral means? Around, Around or just on the outsides. Yes, like on, in your peripheral vision. So here's a, an example of a peripheral protein. Here's an example of a peripheral protein where it doesn't go all the way through. So you have either integral proteins or peripheral proteins. And it's talking about their placement. Okay, so phospholipid bilayer. And it's made, that's the lipid portion, and these are the protein portion. If that protein doesn't go all the way through or is not embedded in that membrane, it's considered peripheral. If it goes through or it's embedded in that membrane, it's considered integral. Okay, this is just a structure. All we've done right now is anatomy. And literally, not that you're excited, but we're still on the plasma membrane. Questions or clarifications so far? Oops, I went the wrong way. No, I didn't. I went the right way. Can you please repeat um, the protein thing? Mm -hmm. Look, like the, the peripheral? Oh, yes. I was like, I don't even know what I said. Sorry. Integral proteins go all the way through the membrane. Peripheral proteins are either on the outside or inside the sides, the periphery of them. Yes, ma'am, of course. So when you look at the composition, of the cell membrane, which we are still on, 75% phospholipids, which is your lipid bilayer. Okay? They have phosphate heads that are hydrophilic. What does hydrophilic mean again? They like water. Okay? Putting those terms together. Then we have the fatty acids. The fatty acids are hydrophobic, which means they fear water. Yes. So they're the ones at the center being protected. You also have some glycolipids. Just looking at this word right here, glycolipids, I haven't taught you what it means, but could you dissect it and kind of figure it out? Something with fat, yes, and sugar. These are sugary fats, so they're sticky. They help cells hold together. They're sticky fats. That's going to be your key to success in this course and outside as well. When you come across a term that you're like, oh, I've never even heard of that before, start breaking it down. Find what you do know, and oh, this is just a glycolipid, which is just a sugar fat. Okay? It's a different language. And then the rest of it is cholesterol. And I mentioned cholesterols on Tuesday. Cholesterols are a type of lipid that are found in your cell membranes that help make them stronger. Because when you have fats in your hands, it's very greasy and oily. But your cells can't be that greasy and oily. So we put cholesterols in them, which are a solid fat, to kind of give them some structure. Okay, so this helps with giving it structure or making it more stable and not so flexible. Everybody good? What are the purpose of the proteins? First of all, down here it lists the two types, integral proteins and peripheral proteins. Integral and peripheral. Integral are the ones that do what? Go all the way through. Yes. Peripheral proteins are just found on the outside or inside, the periphery. The purpose of proteins, let me rephrase that. The function of proteins is determined by its shape. There is no way to say that, oh, all of these proteins do this, or all of these proteins do that. Every protein, their function is strictly determined by their shape. So they might be used for transportation. They might be used for cell recognition. Um, there's a lot of things that they could be used for. And you don't necessarily have to know all of those, but you do need to know that their shape determines their function. Okay? Their shape determines their function. I'm going to go back to my picture real quick. When the untrained eye looks at this, and I'm going to say this over and over again, they're like, okay, well, those are just randomly put there. Those are just random shapes. The only thing random in biology are mutations. Everything else is purposefully designed. Purposefully. The only thing random is a mutation which is just a random change by definition. 
So even though these look crazy and scattered, they literally have a specific shape because they have a specific function. It's always going to come back to that when it comes to living organisms. Okay? The only thing random are mutations. Integral proteins, the ones that go all the way through the cell membrane, have portions that are hydrophobic and portions that are hydrophilic. Why do you think this protein has to have both parts that are hydrophilic and hydrophobic? It touches both surfaces. That's literally just it. This right here has to be hydrophobic right here and hydrophilic right there, just because it goes all the way through. Okay? It has to. Do the peripheral proteins have to be able to do that? No. They're on the outside. Okay? 20% cholesterol? Uh, yes, sir. And those are, um, I can go back to here. See, right here are little cholesterols put in there just to reinforce and help that membrane be a little bit more stable. Okay, good question on the cholesterol. I should have demonstrated that as well. Peripheral proteins are loosely attached to either the inside or the outside, and their function is strictly determined by their shape. Yes, so they can communicate, they can move, they can hold things together. They can do a lot of things, but all of that's determined by their shape. Do you remember what type of protein we talked about on Monday? It speeds up reactions. Enzymes. enzymes. You're going to see that pop up everywhere. Enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions. Okay? Is everybody okay so far? I mean, I know you're not okay, but you're like okay. I get it. I see your faces. Where it says, like, loosely attached to the integral proteins, does it have to touch an integral protein or can mm. it just be by itself? It may look like it's by itself, but it's anchored oh, by another one. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good question. So here's our picture one more time. Cell membrane, phospholipid bilayer, plasma membrane. Everybody okay so far? I already asked that. I'm going to move on. All right. Cell junctions. You're a bag of cells, but you're clearly organized. Because if you weren't organized, you wouldn't look as good as you do. All right? And... What holds your cells together are what we call cellular junctions. So cellular junctions hold your cells together. There are three types of cell junctions. Tight, desmosomes, and gap junctions. We're just going to play the common sense card for just a moment. If it's a tight junction, tell me what you think about its characteristics. It's tight. Are things getting through? No, because it's a tight junction. You probably aren't really sure about desmosomes, and I get that because there aren't very many roots in here that we've learned just yet. But what about gap junctions? There's space in between them. So can stuff get through? Yes. Never underestimate the use of your common sense. Okay? They're described on the next slide. I just wanted to tell you that. Tight junctions form an impermeable junction. What does impermeable mean? Nothing gets through. For example, your blood-brain barrier. Blood can't touch your brain. Fact. If blood touches your brain, yes. Well, you, you could have a stroke. You don't necessarily have to die, but it's going to cause damage. Okay? We don't have to go straight to death, but we could. We could. <laughs> It's, it's totally a deal, yes, for sure. Okay, gap junctions allow for small things to pass through. For example, in your heart, all your cardiocytes, which are technically called cardiomyocytes. Anyways, they're all held together, but they have to be able to let sodium, potassium, and calcium move throughout them. So they have gaps. So they're held together so your heart stays together, but there's small little gaps so that all those ions can get through or electrolytes would also be a term you could use for that. Okay? So gap junctions and tight junctions. These are what we call selectively permeable. What does selectively permeable mean? It certain things can get through. Yes, certain things. So tight junctions and gap junctions, we kind of figured those two out. Now there's desmosomes. 
Desmosomes are where you have cells that are held together that you kind of want them to stay together. Let me give you the best example of this that I can think of to help make a connection. And some of you may not sunburn, and that's great for you. Okay, but if you've ever sunburned before, once your skin had, I mean, it's already dead, your epidermis is already dead on the surface, but once it's been damaged enough to where it's starting to pull away, it will, some of it will fall off a single cell at a time, but if you've been burned, you usually can pull small sheets of your skin off. And what's literally holding all those cells together are desmosomes. It's like your cells just holding hands. And so I'm pulling one, and so I'm taking the whole crew with me. Okay? You're dropping right now around 50,000 epithelial cells per minute on the floor. That's disgusting. Okay? You're nasty. But you don't see it because it's the individual cells by themselves. Whenever you sunburn, it comes off in layers. And so you can peel it. And it's held to you can see the actual junctions have, are working together to hold those epithelial cells together. So they're like, they call them like spot levels, just kind of like here, just holding you guys all together. Okay? It's supposed to prevent like tearing of tissues. So it's holding it all together. Okay, yes, it says that. Holding it, anchoring them, holding, same thing. So kind of a couple pictures of what they look like. This diagram is showing all three junctions, so I kind of separated it out so you can see each one. Here are tight junctions. Tight junctions, two cells are together. It's like they've been sewn together. They're super tight. And remember, tight means they're impermeable, so things don't just pass through very easily, if at all. Okay? Tight junctions. Here we have our desmosomes which are just like them holding hands, trying to stay and hang out together, okay? Just like them holding hands. Again, a great example of that is when your skin is sunburned and it kind of peels off in sheets. It even mentions it being like a Velcro, just holding those cells together, just a physical hold, and that's it. And then you have gap junctions. So this is supposed to be one cell. This over here is supposed to be one cell, and this is where their two phospholipid bilayers come together. And they have... <clears throat> what type of proteins go all the way through? Integral proteins. It's literally integral proteins right here on this plasma membrane and integral proteins here on that plasma membrane and they're allowing what's ever in this cell to go over to that cell. Okay, so they're gap junctions. And they're semi-permeable. Again, semi-permeable means only certain things can get through. So, we have talked about the cell membrane. We talked about the anatomy of it. Being a phospholipid bilayer, it has hydrophobic, hydrophilic aspects, and then it has proteins peppered through it. We have integral proteins that go all the way through and peripheral that are found on the sides. The function of those proteins vary based on their shape. After we discussed that, then we talked about what holds cells together. Real quick, not all cells are held together. Like your blood cells just float around. Sperm cells aren't held together. Okay, they swim around individually. But when you have cells that are held together, like in your organs or viscera, they can either be tight junctions, desmosomes, like you have on your skin, or gap junctions. Okay, so when cells are put together, there's three types of junctions. And that's where we are right now. All right, <clears throat> what's the name of the fluid that's in between cells? Interstitial fluid. Cells are surrounded by interstitial fluid, and what's in your interstitial fluid? What's in my interstitial fluid is probably similar to yours, but it's different. But like your electrolytes, like your salts, sugars, different amino acids. The, the composition is unique to everyone. So I don't want you to think that, oh, well, I'm just going to pump you full of interstitial fluid. No. Interstitial fluid can be anything. And the composition will vary from person to person. But it mentions that there can be a lot of different things in interstitial fluid. Remember, the plasma membrane's function, the whole function of the plasma membrane, cell membrane, or phospholipid bilayer is to separate intracellular fluid from 
extracellular fluid. Okay? Do things come in and out? Yes. Yes, they do. They use those proteins. But if the goal is to keep what's out, out, and what's in, in, and if it doesn't need to come in, then it doesn't come in. Okay? Do you see how this... Um, okay. Now, the, my last question was, can things get in or can things get out or can things get through? The answer is yes. There are two ways it can get in. Or out. Or through. Actively or passively. Active transport, passive transport. So we're still on the cell membrane, just so you know. Active transport versus passive transport. Active means it requires energy. What three letters do we use for energy? ATP. Fantastic. Active transport means it uses ATP. Passive transport means it doesn't. It just happens naturally. Okay? Active transport versus passive transport. The plasma membranes are selectively permeable. I've already mentioned that term, so only certain things get in and out. A passive process requires no ATP. Here's the second description you need. Substance, substances move down their concentration gradient. That means they go from a high concentration to a low concentration. And I'm going to draw this because some of you are like, oh my gosh, I don't know the concentration. And I'm sure I'm not wearing a long sleeve shirt today. But concentration just means the number of molecules. Concentration just means the number of molecules. So here's going to be my cell membrane. And here are my molecules. A high concentration means I have a lot of molecules. A low concentration means I only have a few. Naturally, things want to go from where it's really crowded to where it's not so crowded. So they want to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Okay? High concentration to low concentration. I also use, when I teach this, a waterfall. If you're at the top of the waterfall and you jump in, where are you going? Down. Naturally. It's going to bring you down. How much work does it take you to get down? None work. Because you're going. Okay? You're going. You're going from a high to a low. There's no energy required. Active processes are the exact opposite. They require energy because they're going from low concentration to high concentration. So you're going where there's just a few to where there's a lot. So once you've made it to the bottom of that waterfall and you can say, oh my gosh, that's so much fun. Because you're crazy. And then you're like, I'm going to do it again. Can you just float right back up? No, you're going to have to do some work to get back up to the top. Okay? But you can do it. You can do it. You go from a low concentration to a high concentration. Because it's not a natural flow, it takes work. All right? So when it's talking about the concentration gradient, that's what it's meaning. That it goes either with, going from high to low, which is natural, or against, which is low to high, which is not natural. Can anyone tell me why low to high does not happen in rocks? They're solid. They're what? Solid and what? They are? There's more. But what do they not have that you and I have? They don't have water. They don't have cells. What does it take to go from low to high? Energy. They have more energy. Rocks aren't doing it. All right. Now it would be so nice to tell you. Okay, well, that's it. But it's not. So... I told you there was passive and then active. Passive transport, here are our types. Diffusion, osmosis. Does anybody know what osmosis is? What it deals with? Water. But it does occur in the blood. But osmosis specifically is dealing with water. If it says anything about water, the answer is osmosis. 
okay? Diffusion, osmosis, and then it mentions filtration, which is facilitated diffusion. Okay, so these are the three types of passive transport. <clears throat> diffusion is just going from high to low. Diffusion applies to everything that is not water. So when you talk about salt, that's diffusion. When you talk about sugar, that's diffusion. Electrolytes, that's diffusion. Dirt, that's diffusion. Okay? Osmosis is specifically diffusion of water. So water going from high to low. If it's talking about water, the answer is osmosis. If it's talking about water, the answer is osmosis. So diffusion could be any type of electrolyte, salts, potassium, calciums, anything like that, going from high to low. Osmosis is water going from high to low. It's just being more specific. Filtration is still going from high to low, but it's telling you you have to take a specific pathway. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. So it specifies how you get there. It specifies how you get there. So what we have right here is simple diffusion. You can see I have a high concentration and I have a low concentration. I want to point out something about the way these molecules are labeled. It says that they are lipid soluble. What does that mean, lipid soluble? They'll go through fats. The, if you want something to have an immediate effect on you, it has to be lipid soluble. When you are sick and you go to the doctor and they give you an oral antibiotic, it takes days for it to work. If they give you a steroid shot, and we learned on Tuesday that steroids are lipid based, how long is it to before you start to feel better? A couple hours. Because if it's fat based, it will go to work immediately in your body. Okay? When something is lipid soluble, it immediately goes through the hydrophobic layer and gets to inside your cell. So you can see I have a high concentration and a low concentration. How do I know for a fact it's going from high to low? The arrow. I mentioned that on Tuesday. <laughs> Look for those arrows. If this required energy, it would say ATP somewhere on here. Okay, there's no ATP on here. This does not require energy, so this is diffusion. <clears throat> Osmosis is specifically the diffusion of water. Guess what fats don't like? Water. So whenever there's water in your body, it is separated. Each of your cells is literally separated from that water because it's covered with the fat. But water has to get into your cells, so it has to follow a pathway. It has, there's certain doors in your cells that allow water through. They're called aquaporins. I'm going to show you one, and then I want you to describe it. But why does an aquaporin make sense for water? water yeah, aqua. Uh -huh. a, aqua is water, a pore is a hole. But aqua tells you it's dealing with water. Okay. I have my phospholipid bilayer. I have my aquaporin. Can you tell me what an aquaporin actually is? Water through. It is a pore to let water through. It looks like something we've seen previously in these slides. Protein. Yes, it is an integral protein. It's a protein that has a specific shape. So it has a specific function. And guess what this function of this protein is? To let water in or out of the cell. Okay, so it's an aquaporin. It's a hole for water. Fact. It's an integral protein. Specific shape. And it allows water to go from high to low. How do I know it's going from high to low? The arrows. And you can see that there's a high concentration up there, a low concentration there. If this water just tried to come through this cell membrane right here, what would happen? 
it would be blocked because that cell membrane is made of fat and water doesn't like fat or fat doesn't like water either way. Okay. <clears throat> this diagram right here is supposed to show you the difference between osmosis and diffusion and it often confuses students. So I'm going to use just a quick few minutes. Right here, I have a high concentration of water. The water on this side is more than the water on this side. Can you see that? The number of molecules on this side is more than the number of molecules on this side. So I would say I have a high concentration of water, a low concentration of water. A high concentration of my sugar, this is telling you it's sugar, and a low concentration of sugar. When the water moves from high to low, what do we call that? Osmosis. When the sugar moves from high to low, what do we call that? Diffusion. And it will continue to move back and forth until what happens? It's equilibrium, or you could even say balance in that word. Could I say homeostasis right here? Why can't I say homeostasis? It's not living. Equilibrium applies to non-living aspects, fluids, chemistry, and stuff like that. Homeostasis is for living organisms. And I mentioned that on Tuesday, but I just want to reiterate it so when you see test questions or things like that, it kind of, oh, okay, wait, wait, wait. All right? So the water osmosis went from high to low. The sugar went from high to low, and they continue to do that until they reach equilibrium, or you could also say balance, and, and get away with that, okay? Different situation. We're starting off the same. I have more water here and less water here. I have more sugar here and less sugar here. So the concentrations are the same as it was on the previous slide. However, it's telling you right now that this membrane is it selectively permeable. That means it's only going to let certain things through. So over here, what moved? The water or the sugar? The water. So that means that this membrane was permeable to water, but not to sugar. So it let the water go from high to low. And it did it until it was at equilibrium. And this picture throws everyone off because they don't see it equal here. They're like, wait, 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 that's not right. And it would never look like that. It actually could definitely look like this. But what I'm looking for is that there's, in the same area, the same amount of water and sugar. In that same area, like when you're comparing it. So in this case, water just moved. So because it's only water, what would we call that? Osmosis. Okay. Why is osmosis important? Because you're made of water. <laughs> you're made of water. We covered that on Tuesday as well. The majority of the composition of your body, 60 to 80 percent, those are textbook numbers, is water. Okay? You have to remain hydrated and electricity, which is one of the main control mechanisms in your body, is conducted through water. So when your water levels are low, your electricity travels slower and you eventually will shut down, which is what happens when people are dehydrated. Okay? I am going to, these are the three words I have to teach you. Isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic, or I just read those two backwards. <laughs> Let me show you the picture first. Isotonic is what you and I want to be. What that means is we have the same water, Concentration in our cells is out of our cells, so we're at equilibrium. We have this same amount of solutes, so we're in equilibrium. Hypertonic is when you and I are dehydrated. So we have more water in our cells than out of our cells, so it goes out. And I'm gonna show I'm gonna draw all of this for you. Hypotonic is when you're overhydrated. And you have more water outside of your cells than inside, so it continues to go in until the cell bursts. Both of these are deadly. Too much of a good thing is bad. Too little is bad. This is where we want to be. All right, I'm going to draw again for you. 
and I'm going to come back to active, but I'm going to leave that there so you can see it. Here is my beaker. Here is my cell. This is water. So I have six waters. Six waters. And here is my sugar. I have four sugars. We say that this is isotonic. We have the same amount inside and outside. This is what you want to be. When you're adequately hydrated and you are correctly nourished, this is you. Okay? Where you have the same on the inside and outside. The way this reads is isotonic says that the amount of solutes, I'm going to go back so you can see the terms, and if you're writing, because I'm going to say it differently. The amount of solutes is the same inside the cell and outside the cell. So the, the solutes inside the cytosol match the solutes outside the cell. Solution is the same with that cell. So the solution would be, I'm gonna label this if you have these. Solution is here. And then the cytosol is in the cell. The cytosol. <laughs> is in the cell. shrinking. What happens there is we have more solutes in the solution and less water. So at this point, water is going to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. And because the water goes out, the cell shrivels up. So there's more solutes in the solution. So water travels from inside the cell to outside the cell. The term used to describe this cell, when it shrinks like that, you can say that it shrinks, but another word is crenate. if you have more solutes in the solution than in the cell. This occurs to you when you get in the ocean because there's more salt in the ocean than there is water. I know that that kind of sounds weird, but if you were to analyze it, there's more salt than there is water. So when you get in, a person who has more water and less salt, the water goes from your body to the ocean through the process of osmosis, and then how do you feel at the end of the day after you've been in the water all day? Really tired and dehydrated. Okay? That's what happens to you. So I'm going to show you the terminology there. The solution has, the solution with higher non-penetrating solutes than the concentration. So the solution had more solutes than the um, intracellular fluid or cytosol. Guess what hypotonic is? Yes. Hypotonic is where we have less solutes in a solution and a whole lot more water.
And normally, you don't put yourself into situations like this. Okay, because if you did, you're not a sponge. If you were, that would be crazy. Because as soon as you took a shower, you'd go. Right? But because there's more water outside the cell than inside the cell, the water travels in and it causes the cell to swell. And it will continue to swell until it bursts. When they talked about like that hazing in that fraternity, where they had that gentleman drink gallons of water in a short period of time, that's literally what it did to his cells. His kidneys could not process it fast enough, so it went and found storage in his cells, and his cells began to lice or rupture. And it caused organ failure, and it killed him. Okay? You do need to drink a lot of water, but you don't need five gallons of water in a two-hour period. Okay, that's too much for your kidneys to process. Hypertonic is where the amount of solutes in the solution is lower than the amount of solutes in the side salt. So the water goes from the solution to the cell and causes it to swell. Okay? Let me go back to that slide once more. Hypotonic solution has lower solutes than, oops, than the cytosol. And what was moving in this entire situation, whether it was iso, hyper, or hypo, what was moving back and forth, or one direction or the other? Was it the solute that was moving? The salt or the sugar? It was the water, so what's the name of the process? Very well. All right. Now, active transport. Active transport, there's multiple types, but, and, and I'm going to list them. One of them is endocytosis. Endocytosis, exocytosis, um, vesicular transcytosis, and vesicular trafficking, which sounds illegal, but I will explain. And I'm probably going to spell that wrong. But because it's active, what do we know for a fact it requires? Energy. Energy. And does it go from high to low? Oh. Does it go from high to low or low to high? Sorry. Oh. Low to high. Okay. And it requires ATP, and you already said that. All right. Active transport moves against the concentration gradient. Because it's going from low to high, this requires energy or ATP. I need to teach you the word vesicle right here. In our cells, you can see this actually happening right now. Whether this is going in or out, I cannot determine because of this model. But let's say, for example, something is right here trying to get into my cell. My cell doesn't just let things in. Like, let's say you have bacteria in your blood that's trying to get into your cells. Your cell just doesn't let that bacteria in it forms an envelope around it, and it will escort it. This envelope that it's forming is called a vesicle. And what will happen, and there's a few diagrams that come in here to play in just a moment, but say that this is the cell membrane, and here's the cell right here. So I'm part of the cell membrane, and something is trying to get in, like a bacteria. So it will hit the cell membrane, and then I kind of like fold in, and I engulf it, so I've surrounded it, and I'm going to escort it until I know that it's safe. So uh, that's what a vesicle does. When I was memorizing this in A&P, I remembered vesicles as being like vehicles in the cell, like kind of like taxis, like they were carrying this, whatever it was, throughout the cell, okay? The vesicle itself is made of the cell membrane because it hit the cell membrane and the cell membrane just folded in and engulfed it to kind of 
and sort it to wherever. Okay? That's vesicular trafficking. Yeah, the, we are going to use vesicles for vesicular trafficking. I just wanted to explain to you what a vesicle was because we're about to use it. I didn't want to just say the word vesicle and expect you to understand it. So I wanted to kind of give you an idea. For vesicular transport, vesicular transport is moving large molecules into that cell using a vesicle. That's it. Okay? So it could be bacteria. It could be good proteins. It could be a lot of different things. But I move it in, and I transport it. So I'm just a vesicle. So vesicular transport is just moving things throughout the cell in a vesicle. Okay? Because I'm moving and transporting, this requires ATP. Yes. Oops, sorry. So here is where I have exocytosis, endocytosis, transcytosis, and vesicular trafficking. If you know that cyto is cell, what do you think exocytosis means? <coughs> it's, it's moving out of the cell. So here I have a vesicle, I'm in the cell, and whatever I have needs to leave. It could be trash, it could be something that I've made and I need to send somewhere else, but I'm a vesicle, and then I merge with that plasma membrane and I dump whatever that is. So whatever I have in my vesicle needs to leave the cell. Exocytosis, leaving the cell. What do you think endocytosis is? Whatever it is needs to come into the cell. Okay, so whether it's bacteria, or protein, or glucose, or whatever, it comes to that cell membrane, and I form a vesicle, and I carry it. Endocytosis. <clears throat> we are going to discuss phagopeno receptor mediated in just a moment. Transcytosis. If we are all cells here in a line, and what Tyler has needs to make it all the way down to Isaac, but we're all stuck together, and we can't just move around, he can hand it to me, then it'll be transported to Elizabeth, and then to Adria, and then to Isaac. Okay, so it'll move across like that. That's all that means right there, is that the cells themselves can't move, but what I have here needs to get all the way down the front end. So we just kind of pass it through us. That's what it means by transcytosis. We're just going through that cell. The cell itself is not going to use it. It's like going across state lines, like interstates. They're just helping you get from one point to another. Vesicular trafficking. I swear, every time I see that, I think it sounds illegal. But vesicular trafficking is, if I have something in this mitochondria that needs to get over here to this structure, a vesicle will carry it. So it's just from organelle to organelle. So within this cell, okay? Did I spell trafficking wrong? Yes. I already told you I spell a lot of things wrong. But vesicular trafficking. Either way this goes, all of this movement and transportation requires energy, which is why we call it active transport. I'm about to go into these briefly. Completely briefly. Here is the vesicle picture. You can see that something was trying to come into the cell. How do I know it's coming in and not going out? The arrows, thank you. So it formed a vesicle, and it started moving, moving, coming in. It got to its destination. It'll be used for whatever. You can see here that for whatever reason, whatever was being used here didn't need to be used anymore. And so then it will leave the cell. If it's coming into the cell, we call it endocytosis. What do we call it if it's leaving the cell? Exocytosis. Okay? Exocytosis. Phago versus... Phenocytosis. First of all, phagocytosis is what we call cell eating. Phagocytosis is called cell eating. Phagocytosis is a form of endocytosis, but the cell is eating. It's bringing in large particles. It's bringing in large particles. <clears throat> For example, let's say that I am a cell 
that is designed to kill or get rid of things that don't belong in your body. We call those macrophages. They're part of what we would call your immunity. Not your immune system, but your immunity. And these white blood cells find something that doesn't belong. Let's say that it is dirt. They found a little bit of dirt because you had a cut. It goes up to that dirt, it sees it, and it kind of like throws its nastiness around it, engulfs it, destroys it, and then gets rid of it. Let's say that it found bacteria in that same cut. It would kind of throw its nastiness around. Because when it says amoeboid motion, I don't know, how many of you have ever seen an amoeba move? You should Google it. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, they have, they're just a glob. They have no skeleton. No cytoskeleton. But nonetheless, anyways, if they see what they want, they're just sitting here as a glob. They just, like, throw themselves. And they're like, <laughs> it's creepy. It's creepy. I, sometimes I, I watch it just because I'm, like, <laughs> bored at lunch. That never happens, but sometimes. It's creepy. Amoeboid motion, they move towards it, they engulf it, they destroy it, they get rid of it. Okay? So we call it phagocytosis because it's bringing something large into the cell. All right? Whether it is bacteria or large molecules or carbohydrates, it could be anything. But if it's bringing large particles in, it's endocytosis, number one, because it's coming into the cell. But because they're larger, we call it phagocytosis. Here's showing you an example. This large particle wanted to come in because it's a large particle. It's phagocytosis. Active transport or passive transport? Active. It requires energy to do this. Pinocytosis is the second form of endocytosis. The only difference here is we're not bringing big particles. We're just bringing fluid. We're just bringing fluid. So we call this cellular drinking. We're just bringing fluid. We call this cellular drinking. Let me tell you why your cells do this. You're constantly being monitored by your body. And so what it will do is it will bring in a small sample of your interstitial fluid and make sure it has enough sodium, it has enough potassium, it has enough calcium. It's just sensing and collecting data, bringing in small amounts of your interstitial fluid to make sure that you're homeostatic. If it realizes that you're low in something, it will send a message to your brain that says, hey, we need to make this, or we need to let them know we need them to eat or do something to get back. Okay, so pinocytosis um, is bringing fluids into that cell. It's called cellular drinking. It, here it mentions, most of them utilize it to kind of sample the environment around it, to kind of monitor to make sure that you're homeostatic. Okay. So both of them are endocytosis. Phago is bringing in large particles, so it's eating. And pino is bringing in just fluids, so it's cellular drinking. Questions here. This is showing penocytosis. Fluid's coming in. It's forming that vesicle. That vesicle is transporting it. Okay, so vesicle here again, clearly labeled as well. Questions, clarification needed. Here it is happening on a photomicrograph. So this is like a picture of it actually happening in the cell. Your cells are not this big. Because if they were, you'd be huge. But this is clearly enlarged for your viewing pleasures. All right. <clears throat> now we're done with the cyto, no, the plasma membrane. Beat down. For sure, beat down. Everything else will go pretty fast. I say that. Let me respond to this gentleman about my truck, please. Right in
already discussed this slide previously when we talked about the cytoplasm. I told you the cytoplasm was everything outside the nucleus but inside the plasma membrane. That it has two components, cytosol and organelles. The cytosol was the gray part. The organelles are these different structures. Inclusions are the name that we give to random things that we aren't exactly sure what they are, and they are random within different cells. So certain cells will have various inclusions, but it is not uniform across all of your cells. Okay? So whenever something is referred to as an inclusion, that's just because it's showing up in that, that group of cells. Here are the organelles that you and I are going to discuss. If they have a membrane around them, we call them membranous organelles. If they don't have a membrane around them, we call them non-membranous. And this is just a division slide so that you can see the difference between the two. Okay? Now we're going to go into each one. Starting with the mitochondria. The mitochondria is this orange one. When you were in high school, you were taught it was the powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria is responsible for generating ATP. ATP is energy. The more energy you need, the more mitochondria you have. Fact. If you have a very sedentary lifestyle, you have very few mitochondria. Fact. So if you're lazy, you don't have a lot of mitochondria. So you start to do something and you get tired pretty quickly. But if you're a very active person and you stay busy, you have high levels of mitochondria and you generate high levels of ATP because that's your lifestyle. You can manipulate this throughout your life. So if you have a sedentary lifestyle and you all of a sudden start to become busy or work out or do that, you'll increase the number of mitochondria you have, so you increase the amount of energy you have. If you are very active and decide that you're going to stop, you'll decrease because what your body doesn't use, it will get rid of or it will destroy. Okay? We do know that the process of making ATP is called cellular respiration. You need to know that. Cellular respiration is the process carried out by the mitochondria to make ATP. That's the name of the process that makes ATP, cellular respiration. We also know for a fact that every single mitochondria has DNA in it. For those of you who are going into forensic science, this was a discovery that was made about seven or eight years ago, that we know that if you find a body that's been aban abandoned, been there for years, the DNA in the nucleus has probably broken down and it's no longer readable. However, the mitochondrial DNA is usually still intact. Now, why that's beneficial for you, because the mitochondrial DNA will live for a long time. But this information, the DNA in here and the DNA in here, are not the same. This is your DNA. This is your mom's DNA. So if we find a body and we can extract DNA from the mitochondria, we can match it to somebody's mom to find out if they're related or not. All your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mom. Your dad, he just gave you nuclear DNA because the sperm just has nuclear DNA. All the mitochondria in a sperm are destroyed before the fertilization takes place. So we know mitochondrial DNA comes from your mom. Mitochondrial DNA also controls the amount of energy or mitochondria that you can produce. So say, for example, you, you have low levels of mitochondria despite the fact that you continue to have high levels of activity. That is a genetic condition. We call it cardiomyopathy, which means that you do not have enough mitochondria in your heart, and your heart cannot support your activity level, and it will cause death. And one of my really best friends died because of that. Her mitochondria levels were really, really low in her heart, and after she passed away at 29 with two kids, they diagnosed her with cardiomyopathy. They already know that both of her kids have that mitochondria. So now that they know that, when it comes for a time for them to reproduce, we make educated decisions on that. So mitochondrial DNA is extremely important now, and we know the value of it in the, just the past seven or eight years. Okay? 
We know that that mitochondria has its DNA, its own DNA, because at one time, before you were ever born, before any of us were around, this used to be a bacteria by itself. And a bacteria by itself has its own DNA because all living organisms have their own DNA. So you don't have to know all that. That's a biology concept. But I'm telling you why it says that it has their DNA and why you can make more without any other help. Because it was once living by itself, it can reproduce on its own. So if you know you need more mitochondria, you don't have to tell your brain to make it. Your body will get it. The mitochondria will do it on its own because it's genetically wired to do that. Mitochondria reproduced by binary fission because they were once bacteria. That's probably the most interesting organelle besides the lysosome. Okay? If I didn't have the model right here to show you, I would go through and explain, but most mitochondria are depicted in orange, pretty much across the board. The next one is the ribosomes. The ribosomes, if you were in high school and had to make a cell, the ribosomes were the little dots that you drew everywhere. Okay? So ribosomes... Bottom line, make proteins. That's their job. Ribosomes make proteins. Ribosomes make proteins. They carry out protein synthesis. And what does synthesis mean again? To make or create, to build. So protein synthesis is the making of proteins. You have two types of ribosomes, and they, they, don't, they do the exact same thing. We call them free ribosomes because they're just floating around freely. Or we call them fixed ribosomes because they're attached to something. That's it. Okay? The ones that are free will make proteins, but they'll stay in this cell. The free ribosomes that make proteins, those proteins will stay in this cell. They will not leave. The ones that are fixed will make proteins, but those proteins are going to leave the cell. The ones that are fixed are also going to make proteins, but those proteins will leave the cell. Those proteins will leave the cell. So ribosomes make proteins. If they're free, everything that they make stays in the cell. If they're fixed, it will leave the cell. Ribosomes make proteins. Questions on ribosomes or mitochondria? Okay. The next structure is the endoplasmic reticulum. And if you did this in high school, when you drew endoplasmic reticulum, you just did this. Okay? The endoplasmic reticulum is this structure here. You have two types. You have rough and smooth. What do you think the difference is? One's rough and one is smooth. I, there are some things that are straightforward, and I'm so grateful in anatomy because there's others that it's like so convoluted. You're like... Mm. Help me find my way out. So rough and smooth. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is called rough because it has ribosomes attached to it. How do we know it doesn't feel rough? Just think about that for a second. We call it rough, but how come we don't know that if it feels rough or not? Call it rough because it has ribosomes attached. But why can't we feel it? It's too small. Yeah, if your cells are this huge, you would be ginormous, number one. <laughs> number two, your fingers are too fat to touch something this small. Right? If you were trying to touch it, like, it wouldn't be, it would not think. So we call it rough, not because it feels rough, but because it visually looks rough. And that's because the ribosomes are attached to it. Guess what the smooth endoplasmic reticulum does not have? The ribosomes attached to it. Everything the rough endoplasmic reticulum does will leave the cell. Everything the rough endoplasmic reticulum does will leave the cell. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, everything that it does, stays in the cell. Everything that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum does is for that cell. Rough will serve other cells. Smooth will um, stay within that cell.
So here it explains it. It says rough endoplasmic reticulum is called that because it is studded with ribosomes, so it appears to look rough. Do you remember what ribosomes make? Proteins. Proteins. And I told you that the ribosomes that are fixed specifically to the endoplasmic reticulum, the ones that are attached to things, all the proteins they make will do what? They will leave the cell. Everything that they make will leave the cell. So it says that it manufactures all secreted proteins. Secreted proteins means that these are the proteins we'll get rid of. Okay? And I'm going to talk to you shortly about the Golgi apparatus. I'm not going to mention it until I teach you that first. And so I'll come back to that. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It's called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum because it has no ribosomes attached. All right? Everything that it does actually serves that cell. It mentions lipid metabolism. Fat metabolism. I told you the other day that metabolism is not just digesting, but it's catabolic and anabolic. So it breaks down fats and it builds up fats. So lipid metabolism. It allows for the absorption, synthesis, and transport of fats. The main function that you specifically need to know for smooth endoplasmic reticulum is that it's responsible for the detoxification of your cells. When you ask, when the question says, which organ filters and detoxifies your body? The answer is, which organ? Where does the liver is responsible for detoxifying? When you take any, every, bless you, every bit of blood has to go through your liver at some point. Any drugs that you take will be filtered through your liver before your kidneys. Okay? Now, when the question says what organelle is responsible for detoxification, the answer is smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Read the question carefully. Organ, liver, organelle, smooth ER. Guess which organ has the most smooth ER? The liver. Yes. Okay? When you have drugs in your system, whether they're recreational or prescribed, whatever it is, everything get at a cellular level, everything is filtered by your smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is why after a certain time period it wears off. And in order to get that same result, you'll have to take that medication again because your cells are constantly trying to get rid of what they consider foreign or legal. Okay, even though you're doing it for one reason, your cells don't understand that. So um, detoxification, smooth ER. If I didn't have a model, we would go through this in a lot of detail, but here would be the nucleus, and then here is your rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then right here is the smooth. So it would go rough and then smooth. Okay? Not too fast. Golgi apparatus. This is um, my second favorite organelle, if you could have a favorite organelle which is probably pretty lame. But the Golgi apparatus is depicted on this model right here in purple. Okay? And the reason why I love this organelle is because it organizes things. It takes things that are unorganized and it organizes them. And then it sorts them and puts them into their little Tupperware boxes and it labels them, which is my life. Okay? What happens with the Golgi apparatus? It works like a post office. When you take your mail to the post office, the person behind the counter, or if you just drop it in the thing, there's somebody back in the back that takes each piece of mail and it reads the zip code and it begins to sort it. And it says, all this stuff is going to Oklahoma. All this stuff is going to San Antonio. All this stuff is going to New York. So it sorts it, and then once it has it all sorted, it says, okay, here, I'm going to put this on this truckload so that it goes, or this airplane so that it goes to New York, and this truck to go to San Antonio, and so on. The Golgi apparatus takes all the proteins that were made by the rough endoplasmic reticulum, because remember, they're going to be sent out. Everything the rough endoplasmic reticulum does will leave the cell. All these proteins get sent to the post office where they're packaged, sorted, and sent out. So the Golgi apparatus takes all the proteins, and it sorts them and packages them and then sends them out of the cell. So it says, oh, you're a protein for the eye over here. And it takes all the eye proteins and puts them there. Oh, you're a, a heart protein? I'm going to put you over here. Bone protein over here. And then it 
puts them in a vesicle, and it ships them off. So the Golgi apparatus modifies, sorts, and packages proteins for export. Golgi apparatus. Okay, here, and you can see clearly, I have little protein molecules, and here's a vesicle. Just carrying it around. Remember, a vesicle is just formed, and it kind of carries it throughout the cell. Vesicle. Will the smooth endoplasmic reticulum send anything to the Golgi apparatus? No, because everything the smooth does stays in the cell. Everything the smooth does stays in the cell. Okay, that's what it looks like really up close. Here is showing you, it goes from rough, so those proteins get in a vesicle, and then they're dropped off at the post office. The post office processes them, puts them in another vesicle, and then sends them out. Notice that the smooth ER is not in this diagram at all. Okay, it's just going from rough to Golgi to out. That's the relationship there. And when on that previous slide, when I said, oh, I'm not going to talk to you about this yet, right here, the assembled proteins move from the endoplasmic reticulum into a vesicle, and then they go to the Golgi. That's what that's saying. And that's only with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Questions on, oops, rough or smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Peroxisomes, these are a structure that's supposed to break down things, and it releases hydrogen peroxide, which is why we call them peroxisomes, okay? Right when you're young, your body takes that hydrogen peroxide and it breaks it down, but as you get older, it becomes more difficult for your body to do that, so things get a lighter color, light gray, okay? Lysosomes are my first favorite organelle. Why? Because they put up with no crap. Lysosomes, I reference as the police officers for yourself. They literally float around, and then they find perhaps an organelle, like a mitochondria, that's not doing what it's supposed to be doing, that's malfunctioning in some way, shape, or form. And it says, hello, mitochondria. I can see that you're not doing what I need you to do. I'm going to give you a split second to get your life together. And if not, I'm going to kill you. And then it kind of floats off and allows it to realign its objectives. And then it will come back and check on it. Okay, are you doing what I need you to do? Okay, great. And it moves on. But if for whatever reason you have not conformed, the lysosome will engulf you. And you will implode. It will put... Um, hydrochloric acid on you, and it'll just psh, destroy you. Goodbye. Your body wants nothing that's wasteful. Nothing. Okay? So let's say that I, I get Elizabeth there, and she's, I said, you know what? You didn't get your act together. I engulfed her, and I destroyed her. Well, then, Adria was like, uh-uh, she's my friend. She was trying. Close your mouth. You are gone, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's no negotiation with the lysosome. And then when all of you decide to wreak havoc because you're like, that teacher's crazy, the lysosome says, speak no more. And it literally dissolves itself and you all die. The whole cell is gone. I love it. Much respect. Like, give me a second. No, no second chance. You're fine. Okay. So they're my favorite. They're my favorite. I even have a shirt that says lysosome. One of my students got it for me. They're dedicated. Aww. She never spoke to me, ever, which is fine. But at the last day of school, she got me a lysosome shirt. I was like, for real, you, you, you know me. But we've never spoke. Okay? The fact that it will kill the entire cell is called autolysis, meaning it's going to kill itself. Okay? It's kind of an inspector gadget type thing. Like, this message will self-destruct, and it's gone. And you pee it out, and you never even know. It's happening inside of you all the time right now. And you're grateful because it's keeping you homeostatic. All right? So lysosomes, my favorite. In the event that everything's working perfectly, the lysosomes don't have to do much work other than just kind of sit there like old security guards. Okay? Good picture of lysosomes. All right. The endomembrane system overall. The Golgi apparatus, the endoplasmic reticulum, all of them work together to help your cell maintain homeostasis. 
And remember, all of this is happening in just one cell. Just one. So which means it's happening 100 trillion times in your body. You are freaking amazing. That was for your self-esteem. Okay. Good picture of a cell there. Cytoskeleton. Guess what cyto means? Cell. And skeleton. It's a skeleton. So this is the skeleton of the cell. Yes. It's the skeleton of the cell. There are three sized bones in that skeleton. Microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Small, medium, large. Small, medium, large. Small, medium, large. Okay. That was it for the cytoskeleton. It's just a skeleton of the cell. Okay. Centrioles are this structure right here. There's no cytoskeleton on this cell, so that's why I didn't point it out. But this structure right here is your centrioles. These are only found in your animal cells and your animals, so all of your cells have these. These are what tell your cell it's time to divide and make a new one. Okay. They're composed of the cytoskeleton. They control and work through the cytoskeleton. So that's the centrioles. The term centrosome, so right here with the yellow is the centrioles. The centrosome is just the area around it. The centrosome is just the area around it. Okay? Um, I already mentioned that they are for cell division, which is mitosis. These also function in your cilia, cilia and flagella. We are going to probably have to take a break here in just a second. This is what this looks like up close. This is this, so centrioles. The area around it is the centrosome. Up close picture. Cilia versus flagella. People are at my house. And it's my kids and they're home alone. So please, Aww. it's not, I don't. Are you safe? Okay, they're just getting all that stuff? Okay, just lock the doors and I'll, I'll watch them on the camera. I love you. Thank you. Love you. Bye. Okay. Cilia versus uh, flagella. Is your again? I know, but he's in his truck. Oh, he's in it? Uh huh. Oh, I, I thought it was getting painted too, but he was not around. Or they would probably call him. Or dad, but they're pouring concrete. Oh, he Does he ever work? I'm just kidding. I didn't even say that. <laughs> I should probably text him. I think that they're just picking up stuff. I see them. I'm that creepy mom. Okay. Lock the door. <laughs> I'm watching you. Silly. You don't even know me. And you're like, she's next, and that's okay. Tyler works with my husband, so he knows me. And my whole family. Not that you need to know that, but that's what I do. There's no cilia here or flagella, but cilia are used for localized movement, and flagella are used for long distance movement. But they are made of the cytoskeleton, which is the same as the centrioles, which is why I'm pointing these out again right here. Cilia are for local movement. Flagella are for long distance movement. You have probably seen a flagella before, which is like the tail of a sperm. That's a flagella. There is only one flagellated cell in the human body, and it's sperm. So if you're not making sperm, you probably don't have a flagella on any of your cells. So you know. Okay? But all of us have cilia, which look like this in our respiratory system. You have this in your reproductive system, whether you're a boy or a girl, and it helps to move things. And
and it moves in a very organized way. It doesn't go like this, because nothing would get anywhere. But it's like, what's it called? Synchronous. All at the same time. So you can see that it's like moving. When you get something caught in your cilia, which is lined with mucus usually, and it builds up in your throat, guess what you do? You cough or you sneeze, and it triggers a reflex. Reflex is it's a reflex. It triggers a reflex. And then all of those cilia push that stuff out, and it comes out. You don't really notice all the trash in it unless you have, like, a loogie or anything. But that's what it's doing there. This also is the exact same structure that allows for egg and sperm to move throughout the reproductive system. So when you ovulate and it carries the egg down after it's been fertilized to the uterus, it's cilia that do that. It is sperm that push, or it's not sperm, it is cilia that push the sperm towards the epididymis and then the vas deferens for ejaculation. So all of that works together for movement, but localized movement. Long distance movement is a flagella. Different from cilia, but look exactly the same. Microvilli. So read your question carefully. If it's cilia, it's moving. If it's microvilli, it's absorbing. If it's cilia, it's moving. If it's microvilli, it's absorbing. If it's cilia, it's moving. If it's microvilli, it's absorbing. You, are, you have tons of microvilli in your small intestines, which is where you absorb all of your nutrients. Okay? So if it's microvilli, it's absorbing. If it's cilia, it's moving. See how these are just extensions on that cell, just kind of like the cilia? These allow for absorption. The untrained eye would say, oh, that they were the same thing, and they're not. One is for absorption. One is for movement. The nucleus is where all of your genetic material is. In our bodies, certain cells, certain cells have one nucleus, certain cells have many nuclei, and certain cells have no nuclei. Your red blood cells have no nucleus if they're mature which is why they don't last for a long time. Your brain cells are uninucleated. Your muscles are multinucleated. So nucleated just means it has a nucleus. The root in front of it tells you how many it has. One, many, or none. Okay? Um, but the nucleus has your genetic material. This dark region right here, let me go back to this picture. This dark region right here, also depicted here in red, is called the nucleolus. It's on the next slide. Or the nucleoli is plural. It's responsible for making ribosomes. It makes ribosomes. Ribosomal as assembly or the synthesis of ribosomes. That's what that does. Okay? I'm just trying to give you exactly what you need to know because it gets to a point where it gets to be, that's already a lot. Chromatin versus chromosomes. I do need to show you this and then I'm going to shorten on what's next. You have DNA in every single one of your cells. DNA in every single one of your cells. The exact same DNA in all of them. Sometimes your DNA is like this and sometimes it's all put together like this. Same DNA, this is called chromatin. Same DNA, this is called a chromosome. Chromatin is when your DNA is just spread out, hanging out. This is because you're growing and just chilling. Chromosomes are when your cells are dividing. This is you on Saturday morning. Donuts, just staying in your pajamas the whole day. This is you and your friends say, hey, you want to go out? You don't go out looking like this. And if you do, that's okay. But this is you all put together, okay? This is you put together. This is you just hanging out. You're the same you. It's just depending on what you look like. So chromatin and chromosomes, the exact same thing. The term is chromatin and then chromosomes, all right? You do not need to be familiar with nucleosomes. That's more into biology, okay? <clears throat> I am going to take a, I'm going to do a pause here because we still have some more 
and we're getting close to three, which means we've been doing this for a minute. And we will pick back up, let's do 10 minutes. Let's do at three, okay? Because I know that some of you 